Hey, welcome to the Petapixel podcast. It's me, Jordan Drake, the bad boy of the podcast team, and I'm joined today by my good friend, Chris. Hi, the sweet angel, I guess, if we have And Jaron, the sassy one. <laughs> I was unaware we, gotta, we, were, <laughs> we were like the seven dwarves over here. I didn't realize we had like these personalities. I've designated labels for all of you. We got a really exciting show this week. We're going to talk about an X100V that you're even less likely to have than the one that's currently out there. We're going to talk about our kids being on YouTube. We got a weird Nikon lens. There's all kinds of stuff going on. So let's get to it. This week's podcast is once again brought to you by OM System. The OM System OM5 is the ultimate companion for the outdoor enthusiast. Built to endure your adventures, this mid-range mirrorless camera is a rugged marvel with its weather-sealed body to safeguard against dust, water, and extreme temperatures, ensuring unmatched durability. The OM5 offers advanced technology to deliver stunning image quality and exceptional performance in any condition. From breathtaking landscapes to action-packed moments, the OM5 empowers you to embrace your adventurous spirit while preserving the memories of your journey. You guys reviewed the OM5. Did you do that? You did that for DP Review, right? We, we did, did, yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful camera. Yeah, Basically and, uh, just as, as beautiful as the Olympus uh, EM5. <laughs> <laughs> Very similar exterior to it. I, I do want to touch on one of the cool new features on the OM5 was uh, it brought the live ND mode from the more advanced yeah. ones, which is one of my favorite features on the OM line where it'll actually not only stack images to give you a neutral density filter effect, but preview what that exposure is going to look like before you take the image. So you can just shuttle through your shutter speeds until you find something that's going to make the water glassy or something like that. And you don't need like a real um, filter right on sentence. there to do that, right? Like it just, it just no. does it in camera, which is super unusual, right? There's not a ton of companies that are doing, that's like true computational photography. And yeah, I it's, it's beautiful. You might still want to use an ND filter for like really slow Ex exposures but yeah it's uh yeah it's a beautiful system the, the whole beauty of the om system now is that you don't really need to take a lot of accessories especially tripods in a lot of cases so oh yeah because the stabilization is sick on those things yeah we talk about and, and because you're compositing multiple images you can get away with if some are blurry the camera just kind of throws them out right just like a phone would so it's not just that the lenses are smaller and the bodies can be smaller and everything's more compact as far as kit goes. You can also leave some stuff at home in a lot of cases. So it really frees you up. To be I can give there. like a practical example. Uh, we were just at the Stampede and I didn't bring the OM5. I had the OM1 with me. Um, and there was a... Um, a ride that's spinning very quickly. Uh, I threw the live ND mode on and handheld a two second exposure and everything that's not moving is nice and sharp and you get swirly spinning. You know what? I'll just send you the file, Jaron, and you can throw it. Up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'll <laughs> but, show uh, everyone the swirly spinning this. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I, I handheld it two seconds, which I would not attempt with another system. Yeah. I don't think I could do that with anything except an OM camera. So, um, Everyone, you can learn more about the OM5 and the highly respected M Zuiko lens series by visiting explore.omsystem.com. So, thanks to OM System again for sponsoring yeah, the podcast. You. We really, really appreciate it. We're going to get into some news stories. This week, we have mostly just news because there was a lot that happened. And then we also have like some, <laughs> we got more questions. I think in the last week than I've had to, to field in quite some time. I think it's because we published oh. like three reviews last week you guys did plus the <laughs> podcast. So that was just a lot. And then we also added in the tech support section. So we've got a lot of things to cover. Um, let's start with this really rare Nikon six millimeter F 2.8 <laughs> fisheye that Chris, you, you could buy that with all of your $146,000. Yeah, I have I have just exactly. So people might not know this about me, but what I do is I actually separate all of my income and savings into $146,152 increments. And I put them <laughs> into separate bank accounts. And so then I just choose to close certain bank accounts specifically to buy Nikkor 6mm f2.8 fish eyes on eBay. 
<laughs> Fun fact. Little little known. Wow. That, that, that sounded like it was scripted, but man, the way that you just like flew with that is... I feel <laughs> no, like I can't way. afford it. Are you crazy? <laughs> I, I would damage this thing in four seconds. I'd probably drop it right out of the box. It is the most fragile looking optic I have ever seen. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's cool. I can actually say that I have ever seen because Chris and I have seen this lens We've seen in it. person. Yeah. Yeah. So, it was at the lights auction when we went, uh, you know, we got to, I got to hug Jason Momoa. That was great. And uh, we had a great time in Germany and we saw so many cool things, but this was actually on, uh, up for auction. It was in their vault. It was pretty cool. So you actually got and close Jordan, enough to actually like see it. Like, is this, this is Oh yeah, we could have touched it. I, we didn't because we'd break it, but yeah, like we they let us like handle a lot of really cool stuff. Um, but Jordan did some detective work and found out that uh, this particular lens on eBay is actually the lens that we saw the exact uh, at lens, the lights yeah. auction. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, it didn't sell. That's why it's on eBay now. What? Yeah, it's, just, it's somewhat confusing because on eBay he's asking they I don't know he they they're asking for more than they were asking at the auction. Like they, this thing is valued <laughs> at a hundred thousand euro, basically max. That's what it was like determined that yeah. it was worth. And they want 130,000 euros on eBay. I don't, but it didn't sell for the hundred thousand. It didn't even, there was no, no interest opening bid was 40,000 euros. Yeah. No interest. Yeah. Nobody wanted it. Yeah. So it's like, I don't quite understand why he, they think that the, the value of this thing has gone up when nobody wanted it a year ago. Well, before people didn't know that Chris and Jordan had looked at it, and now that the word's yeah. out, the value of obviously has exploded on it. So That's, we would like yeah. It and now that I've idea. shared my secret about my finances, you're going to see all sorts of stuff for exactly one hundred forty six thousand one hundred fifty two dollars. <laughs> it's uh, I, I really wish that it was feasible for you guys to actually go and like use a lens, this lens or a lens like this. <laughs> There's only two hundred of these were ever made, so they're yeah exceedingly rare and as you've said it, they look super easy to damage well it was cool too at the auction they actually had a nikon to l mount adapter with an sl2 attached to it so we if we'd asked maybe could have taken like a picture of the indoor like the inside of the auction or something like that but because right. yeah there was a camera hooked onto it but uh we were cowards so uh, <laughs> we just really didn't want to break anything you were so scared that you'd be on the hook for their at uh, least yeah. opening bid on this yeah. i did touch walker evans contacts that was pretty cool oh, did you touch yeah, the uh cool. this is so weird to say this did you touch uh the jason the, momoa yeah i touched jason yeah momoa. that that was I, clear I said that already the, yeah. the wasn't this the one that yeah. oscar barnax camera was into did they let you the touch most that? expensive camera yes. ever sold yeah yeah Oh. Yeah. And we did not touch it. We had a nice man with gloves touch it yes. for us so we could <laughs> film it and move it into good light and things like that. But no, I have not touched anything at that auction. <laughs> it's just so weird <laughs> to say touch, as not, not use, just like lay, lay fingers upon. Um, <laughs> speaking of ultra rare things, usually we have to look to, speaking of like a lights auctions, you usually go to like, ah, if you want a super rare camera or a super expensive right. camera, you're like, okay. We'll go with, you know, a Leica. Um, Leica has been out Leica in this case because there is now a camera <laughs> that is even rarer than that lens we were talking about. There's only a hundred of these made, and I guarantee you they're all sold now. Uh, last yeah. week, Fujifilm released a limited edition Disney wrapped, Disney themed X100V camera, a camera that is, as you know, quite easy to find. Uh, as yes. it is um that's they found the 100 that were actually coming off the production line and they were like we could get a lot more for this than selling it to <laughs> commoners <laughs> you know yeah. it's it's interesting i mean first off it's only available in hong kong so and and they're already sold but uh i don't i okay I, I hate Disney. I don't hate it. It's kind of like the the vintage um, art, you know, like Disney way back at the turn of the century kind of stuff. So it's it's actually kind of cool looking. I would not buy it, but I'm sure there's like a hundred people out there. Like, couldn't I have just gotten my camera first, like my regular one? That would have been great. Thanks. Well, if you look at what it costs to spend a day in Disney World now, I mean, you're pretty much like a fifth at the price of the yeah. X100V limited edition. So if you love Disney that much, then, you know, this is just a week at the park for you, basically. <laughs> so it, it, it is $1,920. And the thing is, though, that's not... Sorry, 10000 right? No. 
It's Hong, is it 10,000? I thought it, it's Hong Kong 14,999. So Hong Kong dollar to USD 14, 14,999. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think they're actually hoping to donate yeah. like a lot of the, uh, the, the revenue from this. Yes. Uh, limited they have said that sale. it's actually, it's actually, yeah, for, for giving to a, let's see here. Where was it specifically said? Uh, I can't see it, but it is for, for a good cause. Um, but yeah, it's not that expensive. It's like less than $2,000, but it's oh. not just the camera. Yeah. You also I, get a, like a handcrafted wooden box. I want the box more than I want the camera. <laughs> That's a sweet box. Now, it, it should be noted, like Leica has made a special edition as well. I think a key yes. two of this yeah. to celebrate the, the same kind of thing, right? More so of them, They made though. 500 of those. Yeah. So they're going to be wildly more expensive, but there's obviously a lot more of them. Yeah, it's just, it's, it, I don't know. Uh, this is the second camera company to do something with Disney yeah. around the 100th anniversary. Uh, I just, I thought it was fascinating that Fujifilm made fewer of them than Leica did. And right. that these ones were also only available in Hong Kong at one of three physical locations of Fujifilm stores. And wow. it's just like they really went out of their way to make it ridiculously rare. Yeah, there's there's really zero that chance expensive. that yeah. these are around anymore. These have all been sold. But can we all still agree that Disney's like a horrible Leviathan of cultural destruction? We can agree I'm, on that. I'm down to concur on that front. Okay, but perfect. Yeah, I don't want to anger the Disney kids. <laughs> no, I mean, I wish I had. I wish I had ten thousand shares of stock, but still, evil Leviathan. One of us, uh, or all three of us, know someone in the in the photo industry who absolutely loves Disney. She she's a, a reviewer. <laughs> yes, Do you know who I'm talking about? Of course, and she's a wonderful lady, and we love everything about her. <laughs> and that is, but Disney's been Disney's been really good to their family, though, right? I mean, that's that's, that's a bit different. There's there's employership and stuff going on there. We're talking both. We're talking about Sally Watson, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Sally, Sally's great. Um, okay, so moving on. This one um, kind of came out of nowhere, and it does, to me, make it seem like there's more going to be happening in the next little while here. With the L-Mount Alliance, they got two more companies to join the format. That brings the total now to seven companies that are part of this alliance. The two new companies yeah. are... One you've never heard of called Astro Design, and the other one you've very likely heard of, Sam Yang. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this is really interesting. First of all, I'm excited that Sam Yang's joined it because this gives us some incentive to go back. We have never reviewed a Sam Yang Rokinon lens, uh, no. which is crazy because they're really popular budget <laughs> option. So now, hey, let's check them out in L mount. Um, and it'd be really nice to compare those to a lot of the Sigma options. There's a lot of lenses in similar focal lengths that are that same kind of good value, very good. Yeah, only in the last like maybe two years, maybe even just maybe slightly more, slightly less. They've added autofocus to yeah. some of their newer lenses, which um, they work on E-mount. That's the only one they really made them for. And I think they attempted to release it for RF and that lasted a very, very short amount of time. <laughs> Uh, I think they managed to ship a few. So there are some very lucky people who managed to get a autofocusing RF mount Sam Yang lens at some point. But I love that they said, if you want to update the firmware, please email us directly and we'll send you the firmware because we're not allowed to publish it on our website anymore. <laughs> that rocks. I, kind of I mean, not rocks. If, it's terrible. But yeah, it could no, work I, around I, Sam Yang. I wonder if this is going to put pressure on Canon now. You know, like seeing these alliances come out is great, right? And and all of these partnerships. And so I wonder if it's going to put pressure on Canon to sort of recant. I think it will only do that if they start to see their sales dip. It's the only thing that's going to do it. Which they might. They might. You know, we don't know. I, they, none of them really know. publish any of their like specific camera sales numbers. Like like even though they're publicly traded, they bundle them with other groups. Yeah. So it, it obscures the information. I mean, I know like this is L mount, but like you you have to agree, Sony gets a lot of positive press uh, and a lot of positive reviewership because they have such an open lens mount and that they let everybody make lenses for them. Uh, and it's actually been a very, I think, I think it's been a very positive thing for them financially and, and for their brand and, yeah. and for their opinion, the public opinion of it. So yeah, it's kind of like, I don't know. I don't Nikon's know. doing it now too. So they're, they're, I mean, like yeah, they're, Nikon's they're, starting literally everyone's too, so. doing it except Canon. Yeah, yeah, so and maybe, I, I do maybe think, they'll change their mind. We'll see. Or maybe they'll be really stubborn. Who knows? 
Well, it's getting to the point where, you know, everybody has their one word answer as soon as you mention a camera brand on the comments. So like, you know, for years, if you typed Panasonic, when you're talking about a TV, a photographer would type bad video autofocus underneath the thing. (laughs) Uh, And I think now we can't talk about any RF cameras or products without a sea of, oh, but the mount is closed and Canon is a selfish company. So yeah, once that becomes your brand perception, they have to do something about it. But I mean, going back to L mount, um, Um, I think the initial um, partners was really smart because you'd have, you know, Leica for your premium optics. You had Panasonic for very video centric designs with like breathing correction, things like that. And then Sigma would generally be a little bit more photography based. You know, they would breathe, but they'd typically be a little bit sharper. Um, So I wonder what niches these you know, the Sam Yang and the uh, Astro design are going to fill. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the <clears throat> Astro photography, affordable oh. landscape, you know, the same stuff that they're kind of famous for right now. Well, Astro makes like, I thought they made like broadcast stuff. Like they're, they're like yeah, super for 8K cameras, like very yeah. super professional high end things. And then DJI is also in the Elmet Alliance for anyone who didn't know that. So it's like a Sigma Panasonic lights Cine. So, Light Cine being in there yeah. is kind of funny because that's the same, basically the same thing as Leica. <laughs> but then there's DJI, Sam Yang, and Astro. Something that I've I think has hurt Sam Yang's brand, and I'm not sure how if they've ever addressed this or if it's still an issue. But Sam Yang has not distributed in North America, or at least not in the United States, under the Sam Yang brand name. They distributed under two other Rokinon, 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 Rokinon and yeah. Bauer in the past. Oh, yeah. so it's in a Bauer. Yeah, they did. They, it was I probably probably t- ten years ago, but when they were like first getting into the market, so like you had <laughs> three of the same lens basically with different colorations and different brands around them, which was extremely confusing. I don't know, yeah. like I, I know Rokinon still exists, so I feel like as a brand, Sam Yang really just needs to be like, no, it's just Sam Yang. There's no problem with we calling get, it uh, Sam. We Yang. get Rokinon in Canada distributed commercially, and I, you know, you get a lot of people getting Sam Yang through the states or online or whatever. So you still see them quite often up here. But yeah, it's 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 a they strange don't do, setup. They, they don't do really any press outreach under no. Sam Yang. And I have been reached out to from like a Rokinon, but that's from just basically like a dealer distributor in this area. So it's not like real PR or marketing. So they haven't really done any hard push here. It's important to point out, you know, Jordan and I have said like, yeah, we we haven't, uh, we haven't reviewed TT Artisans. We haven't reviewed Rokinon. We haven't reviewed Sam Yang and stuff. And it's not that we're biased against it in any way. It is like Jaren said, like it's hard to actually find, uh, reps and and marketing that that will actually send you stuff to review right so a lot of it we could review after the fact from the camera store you know their their local camera shop here which is really good to us and they let us borrow a lot of gear but as far as like getting stuff before embargo it's actually really it's a difficult process they don't make it easy yeah yeah and i still have a bad taste in my mouth from remember the initial run where there were so many Sam Yang Rokinon Cine lenses uh, when they first brought those okay. out and everybody was throwing them on like 5D Mark IIs and things like that. And those were horrendous. So I'd love to see the progress that they've made <laughs> in the last 12 years since that initial run. Oh, I'm sure it's come a long ways. Yeah. So I have actually spoken with um, uh, Leica and asked for an L-Mount Alliance contact so that we can try and do more with these, with specifically Sam Yang in this case. Like I'd like us to like, let's go, let's get the conversation started because I'm legitimately curious how good their stuff is because I also have never had anything from them. So it'd be great to get them in your hands so that we can like actually know. So (laughs) on that token, I put in the comments below because we haven't really been looking at the line and uh, back when we worked at the camera store, they didn't stock them. Uh, What are the um, Sam Yang Rokinon lenses that are most exciting to you? Uh, we'll see if that's coming out in L mount. And then, yeah, I'd love to do a shootout between some of the brands there. Fingers yeah. crossed. We'll see these lenses available in L mount by the end of the year. I don't <laughs> feel like it's crazy to think that they can take the same E mount one and just put the L mount on there. And it would be right. Seems, seems doable. So yeah, it's a shorter flange back. So they wouldn't have to change the optical formula at all. Just new autofocus and away we go. Yeah, that would be great. Um, okay, second to last news story. This one's probably going to take a little bit longer because it's a little weird. Uh, I, we didn't cover <laughs> this on Petapixel because I didn't really think there was like an angle for it, but I still wanted to talk to you because I thought this was so strange. Uh, and I wanted to hear if you guys had ever heard of this ever happening. On Reddit last week, 
someone wrote that they hired a videographer for their wedding and they paid their deposit to their vendor as well, the photographer and videographer, as well as the location. So they, t- they, they got all the deposits down or whatever. So they said, I'm working with wedding planners as it will be out of state. I sent them an email to advise them who would be doing the videography, signed the contract and made the deposit. Within minutes, I received an email from the planners stating that the venue had banned this photographer. The company has nothing <laughs> against them, but the venue absolutely will not let them there. The In my first correspondence with the videographer, I stated who was doing the coordinating. They even mentioned a policy the company has regarding multiple photographers. There was no mention of any issues or questions. The videographer stated they had no idea that they were banned, and this was all news to them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, Jordan. videographers are are inherently just, you know, the worst. That's why Jordan's the bad boy of this group. But, That's right, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't. That seems so strange. I mean, there has to be more context. Why? Why would a, a venue be against? Like, is it this particular videographer stated. or all videographers? It's yeah, this I, particular I videographer. And then the videographer told them that the deposits are typically non-refundable. When the when the client was like, "Okay, well, I can't use you. I've already I'm doing using this venue." Yeah, yeah, that's um, madness. Like, he, they should absolutely. And the then tried to push it to their deposit. spouse who also has something. Yeah. So, but I just want to know, like, were they banned because of something they did while filming another event in this venue, or did they just show up as a guest? You know, <laughs> get yeah, drunk, like, trash the place. Some tables. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they, and they, they have like, legitimate never no memory of it. So maybe that's yeah. true. The part where they're like, I have no idea why I'm banned. <laughs> I think I'm, we got to go deep with this. I think this requires some investigative journalism, here. <laughs> I am just I, like, I can't think of a time I've ever heard of a vendor being banned from yeah. a venue and still being like an active vendor. Like usually that's, that's like career ending. Well, that's as yeah. a videographer, why I didn't want to break the Nikon lens at lights park. Cause I was worried, like, they'll never allow me back here again. If I scratch <laughs> this lens while I'm filming. Uh, so it <laughs> could be a similar thing. So the main reason that this person published this on Reddit is they're like, they were, they're starting to stress out. Um, and yeah. they would, couldn't get their deposit back. And they asked, are they in the wrong for asking for the deposit? Should they be refunded? It's over $500. Had this not I been mean, discovered, they would have a serious issue on the day of the wedding if they had been just turned away at the door. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's wrong to ask for your deposit back. I mean, let's let's be honest. It's it's tough because this is a person saying it on Reddit, right? So we, we only know their side of the story. Um, it's pretty typical for professionals to have non-refundable deposits. Uh Usually the reason for for canceling isn't because they're verboten from a location, but, uh, you know, at the same time, maybe it's fishy that they're saying, oh, well, my spouse is also a a videographer and you can use the deposit for theirs. Maybe they're not uh, banned, but then... I don't know. It kind of implies that they're both forbidden. I don't know. It's it's very strange. Yeah, I think if the videographer, say, it was requested to do a job and they didn't have the right equipment or licensing or something like that to do it, you refund the deposit to your client because you can't yeah. perform the obligation. So, yeah, absolutely, they should refund it. I think the onus falls on the photographer who did something wild. <laughs> well, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've made up my own narrative in my in my mind right now, and I'm loving it. So, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, no idea what would cause this other than they had to have done something that caused damage or reputational, like physical damage or reputational damage to the venue for them to be banned. Like, it's, I'm it's guessing just, they physically like punched like somebody in the bridal party. That's my guess. Or <laughs> or they got they got in a fight with the uh, the uncle that always has their camera there, and then they're <laughs> arguing. You know, the uncle's like, "Oh, you should shoot from this angle," and he's like, "No, look, I know what I'm doing." He's like, "No, well, I've I've been an uncle for 25 years. Like, I know what I'm doing too." And then just start fighting yeah. each other and ruin the wedding. And- I, I have to think that it had to be something. It can't have been like them destroying property alone. Like they would have had to have reacted poorly to it. Like if you accidentally break something at a venue, they're not going to ban you from coming back. If no. you're like apologetic and try and like make it right. But if you like break something at a venue and then just like flip them the bird and run out the door, then yeah, maybe, but yeah. He's it like, I thought I was that- filming at a rage room. I had no idea that I couldn't break stuff here. <laughs> uh, it could also right. be the videographer is like a scammer. I mean, that that could be it yeah. too, right? Like, yeah, it could but just the venue not they're- explaining why they were banned. Like, they they didn't issue a warning. They're like, hey, by the way, this guy, don't trust him. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's weird. Weird story. I mean, it, it, 
but I could see if somebody was advertising themselves as a videographer and then scamming people, the venues would be like, okay, we don't deal with this person in any way, shape, or form, right? I mean, it's got to be pretty bad. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Last topic uh, of uh, news discussion. And this one's probably going to be the, the most uh, in-depth. Um, about a, on 4th of July. Uh, now, wait. Are, are we talking about this first? Or are we going to talk about what we've been up to? Now, this is technically a news story. We don't have our big a, one? All we right. don't have a main story this week. We're just going to do some news, and then we're going to talk about um, a, a lot of questions we're getting in the comments. It's going to take about most of the episode. But... So this is technically news. We're not going to d- treat this as the main story, but uh, it was okay. one that I wanted to get your guys' input on it because for me, I am I'm actually incapable of offering input on this, and you'll know, understand shortly. Um, Lucky <laughs> to celebrate the Fourth of July, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg, Meta being formerly Facebook, posted a portrait of himself and his family, including his three children. Zuckerberg, like a growing number of celebrities, obscured the faces of his two older children using emojis. Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla opted not to cover up the face of their youngest child as she was a newborn and therefore not easily recognizable. The whole point of this was they didn't want to show their kids faces online. Uh, Right. If Zuckerberg, who is undoubtedly very aware of how social media companies can use and abuse user data, hides the faces of his kids, then that leaves many parents wondering if they should be doing the same. So, (laughs) <laughs> that's the that's the thing. Mark Zuckerberg hides his kids' faces online. Should you? But he's but it's also so yeah, I think there's a lot to unpack, right? I mean, yeah. as far as this story is go, we also have to remember, is it because I mean, yes, he has an understanding of how these these photos are are potentially used. And and I think we should talk about that. But at the same time, it's Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, he's a billionaire, right? Like uh he's gonna have challenges that most families aren't gonna face as far as like kidnapping and ransom and all that kind of stuff right like it, it's it's in another planet i could see how how certain celebrities would absolutely not want that to be out there uh but at the same time even if you're not a billionaire it's totally valid as a parent to not want your kids faces online and i totally understand it and uh man this is a there's a can and there's worms coming out of it all over the place right now yeah well, i think i think we need to look at it as well as you know this could almost be a pr thing for zuckerberg because obviously he doesn't want people saying like well the onus to keep the children safe should be on meta uh he wants it to be the onus is on the parents here i'm leading by example sure. blocking their faces out because obviously i don't want to invest in any kind of technology to keep children safe that would not be you know <laughs> Why would That's going to require that? a little effort. No, but um, but yeah, absolutely. It is a very touchy subject. Um, well, because you know, I don't know. As mentioned, I have no input on this because I don't have children. But sure, that doesn't stop a lot of people from throwing <laughs> some judgment down, though. Jared, yeah, just, no, of course. I mean, that's but so it, feel it, free. It, it will stop me. <laughs> I will not be throwing judgment. <laughs> but you both have shared photos and videos of your families and children online. Yeah. When when this when this is brought up as a topic of conversation, and you guys aren't. You aren't Zuckerberg famous, but you're like, no. you know, you're, you're famous We're enough. Calgary famous. You're yeah. Calgary. Je- Jesse Eisenberg could definitely portray both of us in a movie. I think. I don't um, think he could like, <laughs> Oh, he's got, he got Chris Nichols vibes all over the place. I don't you kidding? think so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, there's, there's so many, there's so many levels to how you're showing your kids online and why you're doing, it. I mean, why is a big deal, right? So, there's there's certainly the term sharenting where people yeah. want to show their experiences as parents of what they're doing. And that could be as as what we would consider benign as like, oh yeah, we're just out at Stampede with the kids or here we are on holiday, right? And I think a lot of people do that. Um, then it goes a step further to people who use it as a maybe a way to be an influencer, to show a certain lifestyle, uh, or even to promote a brand, right? I mean, the, the first thing that pops to mind is my daughter watches, I try not to to let her do it. But she watches some shows on YouTube where it's like families playing video games together or kids like, you know, reviewing toys and stuff. And there you are straight up. Your kids are performing a, a job, right? You're, you're it's, it's income. You're using it as a, as a brand. Your family has become a money making marketing tool. And so, yeah, there's, there's very different, there's very different applications. And yet the end result might be the same and that your kids don't want their images out there, that they don't want to find this stuff later as, as adults. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's tough. Part of me as a parent, 
I've always sort of had this mantra that your kids are yours to screw up. And I know that's cynical, but I think it's true. Like I say it all, Jordan said, hears me say it all the time, right? It's like, as a parent, you have to make choices for what you think is acceptable for your kids and your family. And absolutely, people are going to have their own judgments. Other parents, people without kids, they're all going to say like, oh, you should never do this. Or how could you do that? And and I kind of refrain from that attitude. I, I try not to really judge what other parents do with their kids because it's theirs to screw up. And, and I say that in a way of like, it's not just photos online. If you go down that road of really holding judgment to people on, on how they're supposed to do things, then it gets into, you know, do they vaccinate their kids or not? You know, are you raising them in a religious household or not? What schools are you taking them to? Like, you know, like when do you let them have a smartphone? I mean, it would never end. Right. And it doesn't, mm -hmm. the, the parental judgment goes on and on and on <laughs> to the end of time. It'll never stop. Uh, so I can only talk about what, I don't know, Jordan, you and I, what we do with our kids. Yeah, I mean, obviously, our kids were online, like, you know, on our Facebook and things like that. We do share, like, family photos, videos. And at a certain point, it extended to the show, largely because, you know, back when we worked in a camera store, um, the biggest thing is like, hey, I want to take pictures of family stuff. That's the primary use for people who aren't planning to become professionals. And it's nice to have an opinion of that, extending it to our YouTube show. You know, we've always kind of gone by the show don't tell policy, you know, um, where we don't just want to say like, oh, this autofocus is good. You know, we're going to demonstrate it actually functioning in that way. Uh, so yeah, our, our kids have been used to show, you know, that like family things. Well, the big thing for me is I don't want to put anything on there that the kids could resent at some point, nothing embarrassing, sure. even if it's cute and funny, anything like that. But also, especially in the case of my oldest, like, he is constantly asking to be on the YouTube channel. He gets, he loves that. Um, and I'm sure some of it is that, you know, our kids are exposed to YouTube. It's very cool to them. Um, but yeah, I mean, on DP review, he did a W100 review that was fantastic and stuff. Like he enjoys that side of it. So obviously, you know, if, if he's around and he wants to mug for the camera, I don't have any problems with that. Uh, the other thing I could point out is, you know, I have gotten a lot of my favorite family photos while I'm testing cameras for reviews. So it's actually, if I said like, oh, I'm not bringing anything for the YouTube channel while we're out, um, you know, I would have lost, honestly, every framed picture that I've taken, um, like a family photo was conducted while I was testing camera equipment at the same time. So it's worked out in a good way for me personally. Um, but yeah, I am aware, like a lot of people just don't want their kids online because who knows what's happening, you know, machine learning can figure yeah. out a lot about, you know, putting your kids in a different scenario. You know, you could make a fictitious scenario, swap out the background, put someone's kid in it. It's really scary in that regard. And I absolutely respect uh, parents that have made the decision not to do that. Um, and in the comments, I will find out that a lot of parents do not respect my <laughs> decision to have my kid uh, in some DP review sample galleries sure. and in the videos, you know, it's, sure, it's for sure. Yeah, it's something people have very strong feelings about. Absolutely. I think I think one truth to really get out there is the instant that you take a picture and and put it online. I mean, this is an old adage now. I mean, but you know, but the instant you put a photo online, it's online. And and there's nothing you can really do to prevent whatever you're trying to prevent. Like even privacy settings, uh, honestly, like having your your Instagram account part private and stuff, I don't think that really stops you know, or protects you in any way. Um, and there are some extreme dangers that people talk about, like people stealing your kid's identity, you know, opening bank accounts and let it lines of credit with your kid's information and stuff. And I get it. Um, at the same time, I, you know, I guess I feel like you have, you absolutely have to respect it. And like you say, I would respect anybody who's like, no, I don't want any kids on there. I don't want to show my family stuff because I, that's, that's a safe way to do it for sure. But at the same time, I mean, your kids are at risk regardless if you want to really look at that. I know it's sad, but, you know, letting them go for a bike ride, they're in danger of something or letting them go to school. They're, I mean, you know, like you can't, you can't prevent all this kind of stuff. And I think you really have to come down to what you're okay with, what your limits are, what you're willing to do. Um, 
as far as kids enjoying it, I think that's important. I mean, you know, I remember my middle son reached a point pretty early on where he in particular was like, you know, I don't really want my picture taken. I don't really want to to do that. And so I was like, I fully respect that. And, and it's, it's not a thing anymore. We don't, we don't shoot photos like, you know, don't even put it on Instagram and stuff. And that's his choice. And I'm, I, that's actually, I think pretty, pretty responsible as a teenager because <laughs> there's so many teenagers who are just putting their entire lives on, on social media. And a lot of it will be very embarrassing, I'm sure, later on. So there's no closed loop. I don't think you can ever sort of have it both ways. If you're going to take photos and put it on on any social media, it's basically out there. Um, I never take pictures of other people's kids. I think that should go without saying, but mm-hmm. I'm sure I'm sure it does happen. Uh, always asking permission of other parents if, if you're okay even posting their kids in your family stuff, right? But as a rule for the show, we never take pictures of kids like minors. We don't do it. We've even had people, right, Jordan? We've had kids like teenagers going like, oh, take my photo, take my photo. I'm like, I'm not going to. I can't. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like, it, it's just like, you obviously have to be of age before I take your picture. Um, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where you got to be careful. You got to protect yourself and protect them. Yeah, I bummed a lot of kids out at the park the other day when I was vlogging with the XS20 and they're like, <laughs> oh my God, are you a YouTuber? Please film me, put me in your video. Oh my God. And it's like, first of all, you would have no interest in my channel if you knew what it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and secondly, I absolutely cannot do that. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, uh, no, go ahead. Obviously, we're on team. It's okay to show images of your kids. Uh, you know, the context is very important. You know, uh, obviously, no bathing stuff or no like swimming pool stuff. Try not to do that. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's wild, man. It's a it's a very tricky. It's a very sticky wicket. But at the same time, I do feel like you you do have to. Parents hate being told that they can't put their kids' photos online, right? Like you kind of have to respect a parent's right to mess up their kids. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we can say in the photography YouTube community, I'm not going to throw names out there. There is a real split there. A lot of people do put their family photos in as test images and things like that. And some are extremely, you know, won't even say like that they have kids or how many kids they have. Um, You know, there is a gulf there just like there is in terms of any other aspect. I mean, it's across all of YouTube, actually YouTube personalities. I can think of some right now that where I I know what their family looks like because they share that. Uh, And there are some where I like, I have no idea what their personal life is because they have completely separated it. And I think that is just like some of the choice that some people make. Um, This was a very difficult topic because it's like, very personal it's to some polarizing. people. Yeah, and polarizing. Yeah. So I appreciate you guys yeah, talking and about it to... and being prepared to face the consequences of the comment section because of it. We have to respect oh. too, like, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not I'm not trying to have an attitude of being flagrant about it, you know, and being like, oh, you should. I mean, I'm not proposing that you, I'm not a proponent that you should put your kids online. I'm just saying that, you know, we've chosen to do so. Uh, we've set limits for why we do that and to how, how what degree we do that. And, uh, and, and there are, we have to accept responsibility for how that plays out. Right. Um, and I, and I'm just saying, I think that's a parent's right to decide that. And, and they have to have open communication with their children and it always has to be comfortable. It always has to be consensual, you know, in that regard at the same time, I, I, there's, there's other issues. Like I draw limits then at like, you know, I don't know, like, child actors stuff like that like i think there has to be there i'm not saying children shouldn't act but there have to be maybe certain restrictions there because it can get out of control we've seen that before obviously using your kids as an income source that that totally changed the dynamic uh when it comes to you know making them work making them get up to do it you know telling them oh we have to have this done we got to do this project you have to do this for this day i would never want to really be in a situation like that, where I'm now telling my kid, like, this is what you have to do. This is our business. This is our job. You know, you have to care. I wouldn't want to do that in that regard because that doesn't seem fair to me. So, yeah. As the son of a farm kid, it can go either way, Chris. Yeah, well, you, yeah, you know, at the same time, do I think that farmers should be allowed to use their kids uh, for work around the farm? Yeah, but I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh... (laughs) Let's it's move tough. on because all I'm seeing in my brain right now is all the comments that are going to make me tear my hair out this week. <laughs> I think you'll be surprised. I think there'll be a lot of people who, I mean, that's the thing. It's not It's not that everybody's against it. It is a really polarizing subject because the fact is all the people out there that are commenting, 
you know, some of them are posting their own photos online of their families. And some of them are like, no, never. And some of them are somewhere in between. So yeah, I think you'll find Jordan that it's going to be, it's going to be quite varied. We'll, we'll certainly find responses. out next week. All right. Yeah. So the, the reason we've left so much time here is because I have, I just had to like do the double scroll with my mouse to get to the bottom of where all the comments that we're going to get to. So we're, oh, let's, be, before Lord. we get to that, we'll do Chris's favorite section about what we've been up to. And to start that, <laughs> Chris, what did you bring on to the show today? Describe it for those who only oh, can hear you. Look at this. This is the photographer's playbook. So this is a actually really handy book. You know, as a photographer, any sort of creative videographer, whatever, we talked about this a little bit, you know, burning out, having a hard time staying motivated. Maybe you're doing it as a job and you're finding that, you know, photography is really becoming work. And so this is actually a really good book that I got from when I was teaching photography. Uh, I found it very helpful. And it's basically famous photographers and artists giving tips and, and tricks to try as like a photo experiment or a photo assignment to sort of either improve your photography or just like break up the, the monotony or challenge yourself or inspire yourself. So yeah, let's take a look here. Let's just flip through. There's lots of good stuff in here. I'll try to find a short one. Uh, I don't, I just, this is random. Robin Kelsey captions. One student makes four photographs of different subjects. A second student knowing nothing of the four photographs makes four captions. A third student matches each of the four captions to each of the four photographs. A fourth student designates one photograph caption pair, a successful work of art and one pair a failure. And then they all discuss. I mean, it's interesting. This is a really good book to look through. There are so many things in here and some of the answers are very esoteric. Bruce Gilden, who says, photograph who you are. That's it. Um, you know, someone, uh, Mark Seely says, forget Berger and read Fanon. I'm not smart enough to know what that means. But, you know, there's really good stuff in here. I would definitely pick up a copy if you're feeling like you want to just get inspired. So uh, what else have I been up to? You know, I was playing Fallout 4, Jaron. I was yeah, talking about that. You mentioned it. That's been totally railroaded. It's it's That's derailed because... I think my all-time favorite video game, or at least right up there, because of course we all know it's The Last of Us. But number two is probably <laughs> Jagged Alliance 2. Amazing game. I love 80s action movies. It's it's like you hire mercs and you go rescue this country. And it's, you know, it's kind of funny, but it's also really cool. Like 1999. XCOM. Yeah, Jagged Alliance 2. Such a good game. Anyways, Jagged Alliance 3 just came out. So I'm I'm you're playing, lost. You're playing Jagged Alliance 3. Yes, it just got released. Like I don't know how twenty years later, right? Like it's it's crazy. Over twenty years later, and it's finally been released. So that's that's me. Is, Is that Steam? designated a legacy sequel? Like they call it in movies now. If it's a video game that comes out twenty years it's after crazy. the last one, so it's it's a there's a different video game company that's done all the work, but the director and the sort of like guy leading the the creative was the same person who worked on Jagged Alliance two way back in the day. And was like the lead on that. So it it has a lot of the same. There was a lot of other sequels kind of made and they were terrible and they sucked and they really kind of threw it away. So this is the spiritual successor to the original Jagged Alliance. Yeah, this game. Jagged Alliance 3 on Open Critic is uh, a very strong 83 with 89% hey, of critics recommending it. PC Gamer it's gave not, it an 81. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. It uh, and, and I think a lot of people comment on how the humor and stuff has, it's really like, it's from before the millennium. So it doesn't really jive with today's sensibilities in some uh -huh. cases, but I'm enjoying it. Right. So that's what I've been up to. Well, if you're going to talk about video games, um, uh, I decided that I had done enough. I had played enough hours and I beat tears of the kingdom. Oh, <gasps> Wow. And <laughs> it's not a spoiler because everyone knows who the enemy of the of, of this game is if you're playing it. The, the, the big right. bad's known. This, I will rank my third favorite version, character-wise, of Ganon, and my second favorite fight of Ganon. And I've played <laughs> almost every Zelda game. The only game I haven't played is the Skyward Sword because I didn't have a Wii. Um, and that one doesn't have Ganon in it anyway, I don't think. So, um, my first favorite Ganon fight ever and first favorite Ganon character is Wind Waker Ganon. Um, oh, yeah. He is like the ending of that game is absolutely incredible, like truly, truly fantastic. Um, I just got like 
like goosebumps thinking about it. Uh, and then the, my, se- so this is my second favorite iteration of Ganon. I won't explain why, because people, if they want to play it, they can play it. But my, um, my third favorite iteration is Ocarina of Time yeah. Ganon, but I don't really think the fight with him is that impressive. So it's like, I, he's, he's, it's not in my top group, but this was a are very not, good game. When, when are you not going really to 600 hours? Okay. Sorry, Jordan, you have to Jordan put in your 600 first. hours to get 100% completion? That's all I want to know. Oh, I didn't 100% it. I, I, I got enough where it's like, okay, I have a full <laughs> bar of hearts and a half. And, and you're not going to? You know, mm, oh. I beat it. I decided I'm, I'm going to be done. I did fully unlock the entirety of the depths. Got all of that. So I went and found every light route. And I w- when I was going around slaying the highest level Lionels for fun, like I'd wait for a blood moon so I could find them again and then immediately own them again. Um, I was like, all right, I, the, yeah, the challenge is gone. Yeah. All right, Jordan, you talk about Zelda. Uh, no, I was just going to say, first of all, uh, wind Waker's such a great one because there's that horrible slog where you're like trying to find pieces before you get to yes. the last one. But the original iteration like, is the worst yeah, because it was bigger. Oh, they compressed it for the re-release. Terrible. Yeah. Um, but if you got through that, yeah, it was actually worth it, which I wouldn't say for most games. But uh, yeah, I'm two dungeons in. So I'm still way back there, but I haven't gotten to spend as much time with the game as I would like to. But uh, yeah, I'm still loving it. And it's still proving a challenge probably because I don't play that many video games. So uh, I'm digging it. Yeah, the game is pretty unforgiving as far as how much damage you take until you start upgrading your armor. Because yeah. once you do that, then you, see that you can tank a lot of damage. But one last thing on this, the thing I kind of wish they would bring back, they haven't really been doing much of it. Triforce, man. There's not really any Triforce discussed in the last two Zelda games. So it's like, that's kind of strange. I miss it. So anyway, that's my thing. Yeah, I'm going to allow it because I love both of those games. <laughs> All right. Um, so Jordan, what have you been doing this, uh, the past I'm week? I'm going to go quick, although huh? I what? could go Sorry? for a, a long, long time. Are you guys time. done talking about Zelda? <laughs> yeah, we're good, Chris. Uh, oh. Chris, I know, has opinions on this as well. Um, my wife and I saw the new Wes Anderson movie. Um, oh, yeah. So, Is that Asteroid City? Uh, Asteroid City, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, and I was tempted to it. like build a custom profile on my camera so I could switch to like really low contrast and super high saturation when I started talking about this because the look of the movie is unbelievable. Like initially you're thinking like it's just a weird grade on it, but you see like, you know, as the skin tones and stuff look normal as people are passing by. So like the set deck and everything is all built to this like pastel color palette that looks like un- unlike anything else. It's beautiful. Yeah. If, but you, if you anyone listening it, what did you is curious, they, we published a story last week where you can, where Wes Anderson actually talks about building Asteroid City and like what that's like. So if you, if you, I'll leave a link in the description, you can go see how he did it. Sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to point that out. No, it's, it's cool. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a really interesting movie. And I was at the same time, like, Hey, my kid's old enough, my son. Uh, so we watched fantastic Mr. Fox. So it's been a bit of a Wes Anderson week for me. And looking back at it, I was talking with Chris a little bit about this day. Um, that I think Fantastic Mr. Fox is such a turning point in his filmography because before that you have like definitely a very distinctive style in like, you know, Rushmore, Royal Tenenbaums, I consider his two masterpieces. Um, but then once he started doing the stop motion, you start to see that kind of cartoon influence work its way into his live action stuff as well. Uh, like the end of Moonrise Kingdom where they're in the big tree house and it looks like it's paper mache. So- Um, I would say that like the first movie that he tried to do that with to, I think very big success was his greatest movie in my opinion, which is, uh, the, uh, oh man, I'm tanking life aquatic, Chris, your favorite one is life aquatic (laughs) brain. Yeah. What is life aquatic? So it's my favorite, except so much so that I can't remember the title. So he did all the sea creatures stop motion. I think that, I think that was the first. Yeah. Uh, where he experimented with it. And uh, yeah, like it's, it totally made the film. Yeah. Fantastic I, Mr. Fox is amazing. But what did you think about um, Asteroid City? Because we kind of, we were disagreeing on this when we were talking the other day. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I know that we have other things to go into um, and I could do an hour on this. <laughs> Um, some of the, they, it has a very interesting format where some of it's black and white. That is, you know, the behind the scenes of the play. And then the other part of the movie you're watching is the play. Some of that works really well. A couple of my favorite scenes are from the black and white BTS. I just don't think it all 
congeals together perfectly. But uh, I think it's also like, I love the performance. I think it's one of the best things Tom Hanks has done in a very long time. He's incredible in it. Um, And it's definitely worth watching, but a big thing I wanted to do is just quickly push back because everyone's like, Oh, when is Wes Anderson going to grow up and find some other stuff? Like, I love the idea that there are still some artists who do their thing their way. And it's becoming very rare in like big budget Hollywood to have yeah. that anymore. So if you don't like Wes Anderson's style, like that's fine. You, you know, I think his best work was earlier in his career, but it's still like an absolute pleasure to just wrap myself in a Wes Anderson blanket once every two years. And, you know, yeah. it's a very distinct vibe. It's a distinct feel. Um, and and like I think it's valuable to have that. So uh, yeah. Do I think Asteroid City is his best movie? No, I, I wouldn't, might not even be in my top five, but it was just so nice to go out and see a truly distinct work of art again. I think that's great. All right. You're right. We do have a lot more to cover, and uh, we've already done 15 <laughs> minutes of this podcast. So here's what we're going to do. So we, before we get to never read the comments, we have a new section called tech support, which we announced last week. Um, I'm going to bank some of these. So if some of you have asked questions yeah. and we haven't answered them, it's because we're holding them because some of these require some very detailed explanations. Uh, if you're afraid I didn't see them, go ahead and just copy paste the same question into this podcast comments, and I'll make sure that we've got it. But for example, I've got five here, and we're going to cover two today. And then like, in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll do a whole episode about another one of them because it is quite a lot. So the first one that we're going to do today is from absolutely everything. Guys, how does depth of field compare between different sensor crop factors? How do equivalent focal lengths affect depth of field? Do lenses made for smaller crop factors have different results than lenses made for full frame? I've heard a lot of contradictions. Do you want to take this one, Chris, or should I? I think we can all challenge it. I mean, so... I guess the first question is like, we should really start with how do equivalent focal lengths affect depth of field? Um, you know, the basic thing being, of course, the more telephoto that you go, the shallower your depth of field for a given aperture, the wider angle you go, the more depth of field you get uh, for a given aperture. Um, how depth of field compares between different sensor crop factors? I assume that means like full frame. Or yeah, APS-C let's say you took a the lens designed for full frame and you put it on an APS-C camera. Would that be different than an equivalent one for APS-C no. put on there? In terms of the rendition of the out-of-focus area, it can. That's very lens dependent, and that's where a lot of people get mixed up. But in terms of the actual area that is in focus equivalence works. Um, so you can calculate that and you will get, you know, if we took a 50 millimeter lens designed for APS-C, like the uh, Fujifilm XF 50 millimeter um, F2, and compared that to a 50 millimeter F2 full frame lens, dropped it on that Fujifilm body, you will have the same depth of field. You know, it's the both, quality it'll, it'll of both the be equivalent to a 75 millimeter F2. Yeah. Yes, but the quality of that can definitely be differentiated between lenses. Sure. But uh, we did a whole video and, for, yeah. um, for DP review where we kind of said like, let's break the myth that there's a mystical depth of field quality to (laughs) medium format. Um, And we shoot the exact same image at equivalent depth of field and proof, you know, there isn't, you know, there can certainly be a character. Like I know there's a lot of beautiful Zeiss Hasselblad lenses or Fujinon lenses that have a gorgeous rendition of, you know, that focus transition from into out of focus. Uh, But the actual depth of field is exactly the same as if you got a full frame camera with an equivalent yeah. aperture. Yeah, you know, that's why we have all these annoying conversion factors. I remember a lot of students always say like, oh, why do we have to do this business of like, you know, um, we go with full frame as our sort of starting point. That's all it is. Uh, but yeah, doing all these conversion factors is because it then gives you similar focal lengths that you can compare as far as depth of field goes, right? So it's annoying math, but in the end, it's useful because you are getting that equivalency that you're looking for with depth of field. All right. Second question. This might be the only one here we'll get to because there's so much more. Um, How does global shutter work on a sensor level (laughs) versus rolling shutter? (laughs) Yeah, I I can do this one. Um, So there's quite a few different ways that it can work on the sensor level, but the most important thing to understand is a rolling shutter is your most common format where it's scanning the sensor top to bottom. Or if you're shooting vertical, it's scanning, you know, left to right. Um, Where a global shutter reads out the entire sensor at once. Um, Now, for both of these have 
their advantages. Like obviously rolling shutter, if you've, you're doing a fast pan in photography, you'll get weird jiggly jagglies in video, especially if you're shooting handheld, um, you'll get an actual warping in the frame, which a lot of people will say like, oh, that camera has terrible stabilization. It's a different subject than that. You can have a very stable camera with a lot of rolling shutter and it's still going to look like hot garbage yeah. if you're hand holding <laughs> with like a little bit of a pan in it. It's going to smell like hot garbage. So the issue is faster reading out sensors are very expensive or very limited in their low light performance and dynamic range. And the perfect example of this is Sony brought out the F5 cinema camera and the F55 cinema camera, exact same body, same processor, same everything. Only difference. One was a rolling shutter. One was a global shutter. And the one with the rolling shutter had a stop and a third more dynamic range. So that's bigger than the difference of going like APS-C to full frame in terms of, you know, how much dynamic range that camera had. It was a huge penalty, um, but you would get the advantage of, you know, being able to shoot with, you know, strobes in the shot. I know a lot of film productions would shoot everything on an Alexa with a rolling shutter and then drag out an F55 for when they have the scene with all the photographers popping their <laughs> flashes and stuff like that. So you wouldn't get that weird banding effect in it. Um, so what we're waiting for is a point where we will get global shutters with less of an image quality penalty. Because even if you look at like red is now offering some cameras with global shutters at a you know, more affordable rate, but it is less dynamic range than equivalent um, and worse low light performance than equivalent global shutter cinema cameras. Yeah. That's the trade off right now. Um, stacked sensors are a stopgap. They're very fast reading out in some cases as fast as a mechanical shutter, which still has rolling shutter. That's a common misconception. Um, it's just it's less jarring because it's not a sensor clicking on and off instantly. It's actually swinging. So it can kind of blur some of the effects of, you know, like a flash firing or led lights in a, in a sports stadium. Um, so we're going to keep seeing progress on that, but it's a balancing act because the faster scanning sensors, as we're seeing with all these stacked cameras, they're more expensive and, you know, and even in the case of like the Z8, Z9 sensor, you know, there is, a third of a stop dynamic range hit compared to the ro- you know slower scanning Z7 ones. So it's going to keep getting better and better. That's why we say like I don't think we're going to see huge jumps in image quality, but what we're going to see is faster and faster sensors, which gives you a ton of benefits with less and less of an image quality detriment yeah. to having the fast readout. This is why Jordan and I in our reviews we actually talk quite a lot lately about the the scan speed or the read speed, you know, we, we, we have to kind of narrow down terminology we're going to use on a regular basis, but we talk about how fast these sensors scan because although they're expensive, faster scanning sensors do give you nice advantages, right? Like, like we're seeing, like Jordan said, with the Nikon Z8, Z9, where they said to hell with a mechanical shutter, our sensor reads out so fast, we just don't need to even worry about it. Rolling shutter doesn't really have a major impact on image quality at that speed. Um, but it has also ramifications for how fast a camera can autofocus, how often it can evaluate focusing situations. Uh, so it can also improve that for, for sports and wildlife. And then slower scanning sensors, yeah, you, you largely, although they're affordable, and we see that in a lot of lower-end cameras, uh, and they have their place, absolutely, they do have issues with, yeah, you don't want to shoot electronic shutter mode. You don't want to pan the camera while shooting. And uh, we try to illustrate that, usually with Jordan running across a fence or a line of trees or something like that, uh, so that we can illustrate that issue. And I, I think, yeah, a lot of people are still confused about that not just the ramifications for photography or for videography, but for photography as well. So yeah, we can definitely talk more about that in the future if people have questions. All right. I'm going to bank the next three questions that I have because uh, we have so many more to get through on never read the comments. But if you have follow-up questions on anything we've discussed in this, in the tech support section, uh, please feel free to send those to us either in the YouTube comments or send them through us to uh, Spotify or whatever your podcasting service is. We get all those questions and we can take them in. We also have a way for you to ask us audio questions. There's a link to that in the uh, description of this YouTube video, as well as on the uh, all the podcasts. And it's also on Petapixel on the story about this podcast. So if you want to send us questions, please feel free. All right, we're going to move on to never read the comments because we have a, a heck of a lot. Um, and <laughs> this is it basically be like lightning round. Um, in, in the previous podcast, uh, a question was asked, what movie podcast Jordan recommended flight check? Blank check. Blank. So check. good. Okay. <laughs> Dusty CR. The answer is blank check. Close though. You got half of it, right? Um, 
Rot Van Rat asks, should photographers spend valuable time thinking they can make money on YouTube? Is that worth it? Can be. Uh, Sure, sure. You should spend time thinking about it. I mean, if you're motivated to be on camera, to be able to perform on camera. um, It's a completely different skill set than being just like a photographer making pretty pictures. So you have to really consider that if that's like something you want to do. Should you spend valuable time? Yes. And then after spending that valuable time, I think it's worth to do it. Then make your decision whether you think you, you want to do it or not. Yeah. I mean, a thing is a lot of the best photographers in the world, how many of them are huge YouTubers? Uh, none. Like you mentioned, Jaron, it is a very different skill set. But if you group. enjoy teaching, I think that's a really good sign because um, a lot of the biggest, you know, photo video YouTubers all started, you know, with a teaching background. Or- and it's it's a slog, right? I mean, you have to be prepared to work at it, work at it and build and build. It takes a long it time. Takes time. Yeah. The kind first like thousand snowball. subscribers is a tough run. Yeah, so YouTube is like a snowball and you have to know how to play the algorithm and stuff. There's a lot to really research there. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Angela Maloney. What should a person do if they want to write or otherwise work for Petapixel? This one I can Go answer. And answer that yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, if you are interested in writing and you want to do more writing and try and earn a way to, to like get into becoming a journalist in the photo industry, uh, I'm absolutely happy to work with you. Um, if you want to s- send me an email, you can do that through the tip line on Petapixel's website. Just submit a tip and say exactly like this. Angela, I hope you do this. Um, let me know what you're interested in writing about, what your history is. A lot of the time we do require that you have some history in writing. You have to have some something you can point to. Is like, this is what I've done. This is how I'm going to do it. This is what I'm interested in writing about. And we can work with you on that. Um, a lot of the time what we'll do is we work with some photographers who want to promote either their YouTube channel, their website, or work they've done. And the backlinks that uh, Petapixel can provide are exceedingly valuable for SEO. So they can help your business that way. Um, if you're really interested in like, this is what you want to do as a job, um, the next time we're hiring, make sure you apply. And uh, if you're already in an active communication with us, that's something that's you're already in the door that way. So like, s- send me an email. Um, anyone who's interested in this kind of thing, actually send me an email. We can see if there's a way to do it. Um, do I have a ton of ability to hire people right now? No, but does that mean we're going to not do that in the future? (laughs) Also? No, we definitely have done it. We did a huge hiring run last year. Did it got a bunch of people on. So like it happens just, you know, be patient and be ready to act when it's uh, something that comes up. Uh, uh, another great way to get a job with Petapixel is just have Amazon tell you that your job isn't going to be available <laughs> anymore and then call your buddy Jaron <laughs> and your buddy Jaron can sometimes make things pan out for you. So that's an alternate <laughs> option. Certainly. Basically, first- it starts with an email to Jaron. Let's yeah. just that's the yeah. simple way. It starts with an email to Jaron. All right. <laughs> uh, so the next a few questions are from your last few videos. Last week you had three, so we have a, quite a few to get through. Um, I've, I've kind of pared these down to the most important ones I thought that were worth answering. Um, from three Yebex, Yebex, three Ye, B-E-X, do you feel like there's a notable photo quality difference between the A6100 and this A6700 for both still and specifically walking subjects? Go, Chris. Uh, not, not yes and no, not really. I mean, you know, the couple of megapixels aren't going to make a big difference. So no, not really. Um, for video applications, absolutely. You know, the fact that we've got a slightly faster scanning sensor, I don't, you know, that's, that's nice. We just talked about that, but for still and walking subjects, it's tough. Cause when you say photo quality, of course, the first thing I go to is the sensor, but maybe you're talking about autofocus performance. Um, Cause that could be it, right? If you're just like, you're implying movement of subjects the a6100 actually has very good focusing with its real-time tracking so i think and i detect so i don't think you'd notice much of a difference yeah i think if you're looking at subject detection things you know like animals or something then you'll really see the difference between them but the 61 does do a really good job with human subjects however if you're even touching on video it is a huge quality jump like you said it's a slightly faster scanning sensor chris it's actually like more than twice as fast as the older one which had horrendous rolling shutter um and the autofocus in video is also much improved in the 6700 yeah 
Uh, but he pa- said photo, Jordan. He said photo quality. But I got to I got to be on mic. I'm here. Photo quality. <laughs> and again, this is another thing too, right? Like, no, this brings up a good point because we just kind of talked about this. Like, if you wanted to talk photo quality, but in terms of electronic shutter, maybe you're shooting silently. I don't know. You're doing events where you don't want to make noise. Then yeah, the 6700 could have a big impact on photo quality because you're not going to get the hideous rolling shutter, right? Yeah. Um, when you're talking mechanical shutter, you're not really going to notice much difference as far as that goes. So yeah, I mean, it's important to understand. That's that's why they're asking these questions. It's a good question. Yeah. All right. Probably not. The answer is you're probably okay with the 6100 if that's what you're trying to get at. Um, this was actually a relatively common ca- question, but I've, I'm going to go with petrol heads. Interesting, but at the price, would you not prefer an A7C? Okay, so if you go A7C, you are getting better image quality. It's a bigger sensor. You're getting better low light performance, better dynamic range. Um, But the difference is that is a very entry level full frame camera. So everything wrapped around that better image quality is going to be a step worse than what we're seeing on the 6700. You know, people get really caught up on the size of the sensor when they're looking at cameras, and they sort of ignore the body and uh, technology around the sensor when they're looking at these. So they, I saw this question a lot and I was like, there's, there are reasons why you would want to go APS-C at this price level. And you just, you just said, yeah, it. I'm, you know, I'm a big proponent of APS-C cameras. I think one thing to consider is, I mean, if you wanted to get an A7C at that price point, and then you're looking later on to move up to uh, who knows what we're going to have at that point, right? A seven R sixes and a seven fives and stuff. But I mean, you know, if that's like your, your end game is to move up to that, it might make sense to get an a seven C if photography is your primary goal uh, so that you can start building a bag of lenses made for the full frame sensor. Right. I mean, when it comes to sensor size, image quality is not such a big concern. It'd be for me more, what lenses do I want to accrue and, and where do I want to see that going forward in the future? But I mean, yeah, yeah the A6700 is a better video camera. Uh, focus is better, actually, in a lot of yeah, cases, I would say. I'd say it's a better camera in every single aspect Pretty than the much, A7C, yeah. except for image quality. So it just depends yeah. what your priorities are there. Um, gosh, this this is a this is a hard question, and I I, I was A7C temp- sexier camera though for sure. It looks nice. <laughs> it does look better. I okay, like two categories better. where the A7C yeah, wins. There you go. Um, so must do Canada says we currently have the a6600 yeah, in a good way or a bad way <laughs> I, I don't know um our business is mostly video with some photography they currently have the a6600 um is it still worth looking at a full frame sony a7s3 or fx3 they are doable the price is, is doable the, the price is just lenses and they're wondering what the top advantages are to going from an a6600 or an a6700 to one of those video focused full frame cameras is it just low light I mean, low light is a big one, um, but obviously those are faster scanning sensors because they're quite a bit lower resolution. Um, Those are both 12 megapixel bodies. Uh, So that's giving you the option of faster frame rates, um, you know, getting 4K60 without a crop, 4K 120 with one. Now that's very similar to what you see on the A6700 uh, because it's a faster reading out sensor. Um, but, uh, yeah, you also get the capability of shallower depth of field if you use appropriate full-frame lenses. If that's a look that you're really going for, that would be a strength as well. But uh, the 6700 does definitely check a lot of boxes. It's a huge upgrade on the video front. But the other thing I want to mention is if you're planning to use this for professional work, the overheating can be a concern on high frame rates with the 6700. So yeah. maybe an FX30 is that would probably be the one I was I'd look say, at what for do you think professional. FX30, yeah, same chip, you know, um, more, but again, more video oriented. Uh, it sounds like they want to do well, still some both, photography. Yeah, it's video with some photography. So yeah, um, well, Chris, you can answer this one from uh, Jehovah. Uh, on the A6600, the raw files would be downgraded to 12-bit in 11 frame per second bursts. Do you know if the A6700 is able to record full 14-bit raw files in 11 frames per second? I, I believe it does. Yeah, since uh, they they moved yeah. to lossless compressed, which I believe never drops the bit rate. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of the very frustrating things with some of these cameras is we shipped it back before the review was published. Uh, they needed it back well in advance of the embargo which makes it really tough for us to test things once a video comes out we like to answer questions in the comments i don't have the camera anymore but uh, we'll have it back again soon we're going to do that a6700 xs20 r7 shootout 
and I can absolutely check and make sure. Uh, but I do believe it's 14 bit. Yeah, I believe it is too. All right. That is all from the a 6700 one question for the sony <laughs> and the reason i put this in here is because it was a common sentiment um the tamron 70 to 300 came up quite often in like should you just get that instead of sony's new what is it uh 70 to 2 f4 yeah so thoughts are you guys is that something you would consider comparing i mean it's not quite the same lens but I really like that Tamron lens, um, but I do think they're different classes. Chris, what do you think? Between the Tamron 7300 and the Sony? 70 to 2 F4, yes. Oh, yeah, they really are different. <sighs> yeah, that's, that's, it's tough because like when you're not doing pure apples to apples, like if, if Tamron had a 70 to 200 F4, then you would be able to basically say which one you preferred for what yeah. reasons. These are very different lenses. And that's that's the hardest thing to try and convey when answering questions like this is like... I would... I mean, here's the thing. I would go back to the fact that... I mean, the 7200 F4 is a beautiful lens. I, I think they, they tick so many boxes with that. There's really nothing to complain about on that lens. Uh, I was expecting it to maybe not be quite as good optically as it was. Not just sharpness, but like nice bouquet, well-corrected uh flare wasn't an issue you know no loca or anything so they did a really good job with the lens that we had and there the push is always if you're going to go wider aperture lenses yes the light gathering is nice uh the fact that you have a fixed aperture whether you're at 70 or 200 is nice but also the fact that you can then have the versatility of putting on a teleconverter so that you can get that longer distance range so, I mean, if if the budget allows for it, I would go 7200 F4 and then look at getting a teleconverter if you really needed that extension of range, right? Well, Otherwise, well, like budget is such a big thing you pointed out there because I, yeah. I, I believe the Tamron is like a third the price of that Sony, yeah. which again is why I'm saying it's a tough thing to compare. They're just different class. Yeah, yeah 70 to 300. But 7300 is a great lens, especially if you want to like just have an all-in-one travel lens. You don't want to worry about teleconverters. You don't want to mess around. Yeah, but yeah, if you can afford it, that 7200 F4 is probably a, a, an investment that's worth doing. Yeah, it's a $500 lens versus whatever yeah. the 70 to 200 is. $1,700 lens. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a huge yeah, difference. That's, it's, that's what's tough. It's, <laughs> it, you, people want to know which one they should buy, and it's just like, I don't know how much money you have, and like, what's important How does you? it compare? It's yeah. way better. You just yeah. have to pay for it. There you go. Okay, now, Fujifilm XS20, last section. Um <laughs> You guys just took forever to do that review. Uh, the, we got to... <laughs> Thanks, this, Let's not get into it. This came up several times. Cool. Thanks, guys. Where's the XS30 review? Okay, I yeah. want to address this. When you're about to make a comment that you think is like a, a good funny joke that Chris and I will have a chuckle about, just scroll down one page on the comments and just check, see if anybody's already made that joke. <laughs> because I believe we have like dozens of people saying when's the xs30 review yeah. coming out at yeah, this was, point and the first time you know it got like an arched eyebrow from me i wouldn't even say i was lolling but <laughs> <laughs> but every time my phone one, is like bling you've got a comment yeah. and it's another person like where's the xs30 like just do do me a solid and see if that joke <laughs> has already been made i would really appreciate that but uh, the answer is roughly three years from now <laughs> <laughs> Chris, um, yeah. did you buy anything cool? Did you find anything that you actually like wanted to so own at the I flea market? I didn't buy anything. I mean, so to be honest, we met this guy, Tony. I think his name is Tony, if I remember correctly. And he'd just taken over one of these flea market camera sections from this other guy. So he was kind of still trying to learn all the inventory. And it was frankly, like, as you've probably seen the video, it's like a mess. It's like all over the place. He's got to organize, catalog, everything. I do not envy this man's like, like few weeks uh, coming up to do all that because it's a lot right a lot of dusting a lot of organizing testing all that kind of stuff but um there was one cool thing there that i don't think i've personally seen before there was a mamiya uh it's it's like the uh removable mag i think it was called the mamiya magazine 35 and actually it's pretty cool the whole back comes off the camera it's got a light shield so you got your 35 mil film in there loaded up you could take 10 shots 15 shots whatever dark slide in, remove this magazine and put another magazine in. And that was pretty cool. I didn't know that actually existed from Amiya. Unfortunately, the lens was buggered. The, the, the shutter was working. The timing actually wasn't bad, but the front was starting to like actually separate and come apart. The actual barrel was damaged. So that sucked. Otherwise I probably would have bought it. It, it, it was pretty cool. I've never seen that before. Uh, so that was, that was neat. 
Yeah, it's a similar idea to like interchangeable film backs for medium format cameras, sure. but for 35. It was it's cool. Like I you know, we probably could have said like, oh, that's worth three dollars and it would look really cool on a mantle, but we didn't want to take advantage of poor Tony that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> I, I, I had one question. Most people were just glad you did the review. One question about the XS20. Can you program video settings onto the custom function dial? Yeah, so I checked this. Um, I tested that last night, and absolutely you can. And I really like that it'll actually give you separate custom functions for photo and for video. So you can actually have eight custom uh, settings in the wheel there, which is, yeah, really nice to have. The one thing I will say is if you're in photo mode to set, to put uh, your settings to one of those custom memory banks, it's in the image quality section in the menu. I was <laughs> digging everywhere. Like, what does that, I mean, it, we're going to touch on it in a future video, but Fujifilm just needs to revamp all of their menus as soon yeah. as possible. It's mad. They really do. Not the only company that's ever had to do that before. No. <laughs> Sony. No, no. Okay. So. <laughs> on that, that is it. That is the end of the podcast. Next week's podcast is going to be a banger. I'm really excited about yeah. it. I, I don't want to say what it is in case something falls through, but I'm, I, and then I'll have to make up another topic that'll be a banger to make sure that I'm I'm correct when I say that. But I'm guaranteed really excited for next banger. Week. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be it'll be a, a podcast of cosmic proportions. That is a great way to put it. So on that note, thanks everyone for joining us this week. Thanks again to OM System for sponsoring this episode. We are greatly appreciative, and we will catch you all next time.